Ever wonder what soil has to go through when you drop it off to the time you get the results? Well, here on this Debaco University video, I'm going to go through the path of soil in a soil testing lab. So here in this video, while it is a little bit longer, it's going to take you through step by step the process going through a soil lab. We're fortunate enough to be allowed in at the University of Connecticut, UConn Soil Lab, and Dawn will be our guide here. She runs the lab and she walks us through the entire process. Now what's that process going to entail? Well the basic process is going to be receiving, we start with the receiving of the soil, where the soil is first processed in the lab, paper and payment are checked, the drying of those samples. So samples are initially dried and while growers should not be sending wet samples, this allows for consistent moisture levels of all samples. Then there's a grinding and sifting to occur, which is screen to screen out larger material. Subsampling is provided to allow a consistent volume. We're going to see the ICP, which is the inductively coupled plasma running machine where it has extremely high temperatures, basically hotter than the sun, uh, to utilize and analyze different nutrients. You can see how uh, organic matter is calculated with the LOI or loss on ignition uh, method where essentially the samples are burned off, uh, the organic materials burned off. Then we have the sand, silt, and clay percentages, importance of determining pH, phosphorus run on its own uh, analyzer, and then the end result or the report with some results and kind of some going through the results with some specific uh, guidance for cannabis. So thank you, Don, again at the University of Connecticut lab. I uh, hope you enjoyed the video here walking uh, the process that soil takes through a soil lab. Ever wonder what happens to your soil after you collect it and before you get the numbers? Today we're going to get to see the soil testing lab here at the University of Connecticut and the exact process that your soil goes through while your lab here is going to be generating the numbers for you. Let's go inside. Welcome to the Yukon Soil Testing Lab in April. We, get, uh, we do about 10,000 soil samples a year and about 3,000 of them we do in April. So this is our busiest month. Um, we're going as fast as we can, but we are limited <laughs> to how fast us and the equipment can work. Well, the samples come in any way imaginable. They come in in little packages, they come in in boxes. What we do is, first the thing we do is we open up your package, we really, really like it when you fill out our paperwork because it saves us a lot of time. We're looking for a name, address, phone number, and email so we can email you the results. We look to see that you gave us the right, correct amount of money. We know what test you want. We only need a cup of soil for our, our standard nutrient analysis. And then we take the soil, we spread it on little pieces of paper and we're going to let them dry overnight. We have fans and we have a heater and we can spread about 300 soils to dry. So these are all soils that are drying. Um, and then after we finish drying them, the next day we'll start sieving them. They're actually have many beautiful colors. I, I like, the, I like red. the variable, yeah. I like the red. This is actually, we do have a lot of red soils in Connecticut. People think it's from, uh, because they're clay soils. We don't actually have a lot of clay soils in Connecticut. The red color is due to the iron. So if you're ever driving down 84 and you see those red rocks along the road, those are Triassic red sandstone. And usually the red color denotes a pretty well aerated soil. It also denotes the soil kind of low in organic matter because if it had more organic matter, the, the organic matter would, would color up, would cover up the red color. So after they, the soil is dry, we end up putting them through a two millimeter sieve. So the two millimeter sieve is, a, is defines what soil is. Mineral soil particles are less than two millimeters in size. We put them through the sieve and then we put them in numbered cups. And these numbered cups, we start with number one, and here we are in April, and we're up to 2,664. And then we, we, we do have a stamp, so we make sure that the paperwork is stamped with the same number that the soil goes into in the cup. 
we dry and sieve the soils and put them into numbered cups, we need to extract them because we can't just take soil and pour it into our machines. We, we need to use some sort of a liquid. Um, everything that we do is like a book. Everything goes top to bottom, left to right. The first cup is empty and that's because it's our check soil. We have four different check soils or QCs, quality controls, and we just rotate them. They all have slightly different pHs and amounts of nutrients in it. And I see here that the next check soil we would use would be number two. So I'm gonna take some out of here. We wanna get as level as we can. Put it in our little Erlenmeyer, give it a tap, and then we can start putting our samples in. So again, we'll take a scoopful, we'll tap it till it's pretty level, put it in our Erlenmeyer, and go on to the next one. Um, so this is what we're trying to do here. Is we want to, this is kind of like a little factory. We want to make our, our end product for our, our soil extraction, we want to make it so that we can read it on all of our equipment. And according to the soil test procedure that we use, which is for a modified Morgan, we're taking four cc's, this is a four cc scoop, and we're going to add 20 mils of this modified Morgan solution. So we're doing a five time dilution, and the reason why we're doing that is because about 95% of the samples that we are analyzing will fall in the standard curve that we are using to calibrate the equipment. We don't really want to do more dilutions than we have to. Um, and, and this way, um, anytime you're doing any kind of analysis, you want to make sure that what, what solution you're going to be analyzing or whatever material you're going to be analyzing will fall in the calibration range of the particular piece of equipment that you're using. Some people give us very tiny amounts of soil. <laughs> Again, we really only need, you can see, these are three ounce you know, drinking cups. When we sieve your soil and we mix them up, this is what we put them into. So we do not need a really large amount of soil. We just really need about a cup of soil for the standard nutrient analysis. Now this analysis runs, we do the pH, we also do a buffer pH, which um, is not important to you, but it's how we make our limestone recommendations. And we measure all the major plant nutrients, calcium, magnesium, phosphorus, potassium, but we don't measure nitrogen. And we often get, people often ask, well, how can you make nitrogen recommendations if you don't measure it, for one, and then they say, well, why don't you measure it? We don't measure it because it fluctuates so widely in the soil depending upon environmental conditions that at best would be giving you a snapshot of how much is in your soil today and at worst would actually be giving you a, um, a false number. So we can make nitrogen recommendations based on field studies. So we know that turf for instance needs three pounds of nitrogen per thousand square feet per year. Peppers only need one pound of nitrogen per thousand square feet per year. So we measure all the other elements we measure the trace elements like copper and manganese and boron and zinc and iron. And then we um, also do a lead scan because about 20% of the samples that we get actually have elevated lead levels in them. And that's because we're, it's a very, very old state Connecticut is. We've used lead paint for a long time. There's a lot of old lead painted buildings. They used to use lead in the um, gasoline. And Lead arsenate was used as a pesticide in, in orchards, and we had a lot of apple and pear orchards in the past. So since we're able to add that on when we measure all the nutrients at no extra cost, we figured as a public service option, it's a good thing for us to be able to offer, and so we do do that. So our soils are extracted following the recommended soil test procedures of the Northeast United States. And if anybody wants to see that, it's on the University of Delaware's website. We're part of a federal working group, and we've developed methodology for all of the states in the Northeast as far down as West Virginia. So what we're trying to do is we need to remove from the soil the nutrients that are available to your plants. And we use something called the 
modified Morgan extract. It was invented by Dr. Morgan at the Connecticut Ag Experiment Station in the 40s. And what it does is this extraction solution, it, rep it replicates what a plant is able to take out of the soil. So what we end up doing is we take four cc's of the soil and we add 20 mils of extracting solution and we put them on the shaker for 15 minutes and let them shake and then we pour through filter paper and then we get the extracts and the extracts are what we run in our equipment. This back in here. We keep about a thousand soils so we just rotate. So if you need an extra test, say organic matter, you would need to call us up pretty quick in the springtime because we're, as we're running a hundred soils a day, within two weeks time, a thousand soil has already been dumped. You can pull any of those trays out if you want, it's fine. But I will, um, after we pour our samples, we wait for all the, the extract to go through, and then we're gonna get rid of all the filter papers, and take the funnels off, and then we will wash our funnels out, and we'll have the test tubes filled with extracts that can be run on our two pieces of equipment to give you all of the elements that you need to grow good plants. Let me get our little rack. We write down the numbers of the ones we're doing. Put them in our little rack and bring them into the other room so we can put them on the analyzer. Extracted and they're in these little test tubes. We get a clear extract. If we don't have a clear extract, then we refilter them. And we're gonna run them on two different types of analytical equipment. We're going to run it on a discrete analyzer to measure orthophosphate, and then we're going to measure, we'll put it on an ICP to measure all the other elements. So I can't fit these test tubes on the um, discrete analyzer, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to pour a little bit in each of these cute little containers and put them in this wrap. And then we'll set them up to run orthophosphate. You know, as you can see, our samples aren't really very large that we end up with. So it's really important that whoever's taking the soil sample do a good job in taking a representative sample so that the small amount that we actually pull out of the sample is a, bit, a good average of what you actually have in your soil. So here we're using about five, about five mils, maybe a little bit less. And then, once we get them all poured into these little sample cups, we're gonna take the whole little rack and we're gonna put it in our discrete analyzer here. So in there we have, we have different reagents, we have our matrix, and we have a high standard. And this high standard will get diluted and put into these six little cups and that's how we make our standard curve. So this is a, this is a, a discrete analyzer. Um, it measures basically absorption. So what happens is the, the sample probe picks up some of the sample and some of the reagent and it puts it in little cuvettes and the cuvettes are kept in here and these little and they put in these little cuvettes and these little cuvettes they incubate they're on a heated tray and they incubate and what happens is with the reagent the more phosphorus that's in the soil the darker the color blue it is so what this machine is doing is it's looking at how much light is absorbed so say for instance you had a, a clear you had a cup full of clear Kool-Aid and then, or clear water, and then you had, and then you had maybe a, uh, another glass full of blue Kool-Aid. Although this is not Kool-Aid, and if you shone a light through the clear water, you'd be able to see almost all the light that goes through it. 
if you shone a light through your blue solution, only some of the light would get through, the rest would get absorbed. So what that's what this machine does. It measures the amount of light that's absorbed. And the more light that's absorbed, the higher concentration of phosphorus. So we're going to tell this to start. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to, first thing I'm going to tell us what um, method to use. So we're going to use orthophosphate method. And then I need to tell it how many samples. I have 48 plus I have a, a LCS, a least control standard. And I have to tell it the first number we're on. And then I'll say, okay, load these samples up. So then it's going to load them all up. And I'm just going to change the last one to LCS. And then I'm going to ask it to save it. All right, to save it, what do I want to call it? We typically just call it by the date. So, and then this is the first set of the day, so it's going to be A. All right, so now I'm going to call it up. I'm going to go into my system. And you can see this is where I loaded all the samples. This is my LCS. These are my reagents. That's my matrix. That's my high standard, and that's where it's going to make the other standards. So I'm going to tell this to run. I'm going to want it to do a, a water blank. It's going to calibrate. Press the little button. And in about two hours worth of time, I should be able to get all my phosphorus numbers off of this. It's actually making the standards now. So we took some took some reagent and took some standard and put it in those little cups and it's going to mix it up. And uh, eventually we'll get a curve. We can look at the curve. And I hope it's like 0 0.999. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so it's going to It picks up a little bit of all the reagents and picks up a little bit of whatever sample it wants to and then it puts it in the cube bed. That's what it's doing now. And it rinses itself off in the well. And it goes get some more reagent. Rinse. It's a curious little instrument. I know. It goes through that rinse process, brings it up. It knows exactly what it's supposed to do. It knows that you, t you program into how much of each of these reagents to put in. The key is when you're programming this is that you have to make sure you're not telling it to put more liquid in that can be held in that little key. So that's one of the coolest things about this machine is that you just put in one high standard and it makes all the standards so it makes the curve for you our best to educate them on they want you want your nutrients to be in the optimal range. I can actually see if this goes on down. Yeah, this is what the results look like. So this is reading this reads the optical density, which is remember I said that you have it's it's adding reagents that turn it bluer the more phosphorus so it would be more dense the more bluer it is so the higher optical density and it translate that into the concentration that's how much we know how much phosphorus is in your soil sample you notice that some of the this, this isn't really great but you notice some of them are a little bit darker than others typically the ones that are a little bit darker than others have a little bit higher organic matter concentration in them um, What's really cool is to look at the saturated media ones because some of them come out oh. like copper, blue, or blue green. Oh. I'm gonna grab this and put this on the ICP. Yeah, these are all our standards. 
So we end up, we, end, we use standards to calibrate, and these are known amounts, and then we have another least control standard and um, for all the elements and except for sulfur, and then we have a separate one for sulfur. So every time we run, we calibrate, and then we run a known QC with the set, difficulties here <laughs> and, and then we run known QC's with the calibration yeah. so this is our ICP that stands for um, inductively coupled argon plasma spectrometer it's run on plasma a plasma is actually a fourth state of matter there's solids there's gas there's liquids and there's plasma this is so hot this is uh, 6,000 degrees centigrade it's actually hotter than the Sun and the thing that's neat about this is we're able to run, this is, this is a, a atomic emission. So I don't know if you remember back from chemistry, but every single atom has a nucleus, and around the nucleus it has electrons that are traveling. This is so hot that what this does is the, the um, machine, the sample will pick up some of your sample, it will put it into the spray chamber, the spray chamber, and there's a little nebulizer there, it breaks it all up, and some of the spray from your, the sample that we poured goes into the plasma. And so what happens is the plasma is so hot, it excites those electrons, and it causes them to um, raise up out of their characteristic ground state orbital. And so when, it, when they do, they're, they're just doing that for a brief period of time, and they fall back down, and when they fall back down, we have an optical system in here, and we set it on different wavelengths. And we've told the we told the machine what wavelengths to use. So when we're running, we'll be running um, potassium at 766 and calcium at 183 and phosphorus at 177. So it, it's looking for those wavelengths, and it measures the intensity of the wavelengths and the intensity of the wave proportion to the concentration of the element. When we're standardizing with the ICP, we're actually measuring counts per second. That's what CPS stands for. And what we want to do is we want to see as the standards, as it takes up more and more standards, we want to see the numbers increasing. And then we know we have a nice linear fit. So we have crucibles. And the crucibles, we get a weight on them. We put some soil in the crucible. We let it sit in the oven at 105 degrees centigrade for two hours. Then we take it out, we reweigh it. So we, now we have an oven dried weight. And then we put it in our furnace and our furnace goes up to 375 degrees um, centigrade. So, and then at, after we put it in the furnace, has to be in there for a minimum of two hours, but we usually end up leaving it longer because we just run out of time. And we'll take it out and we'll get a measurement of it. So we don't want to touch these until we get a measurement of it because we could have grease or something on our hands. So I'll put it on our little, we check to see there's a number on the bottom of the crucible. We put it on our scale and then we can measure. Sorry, I can't see. And we can measure how many grams is in there. So this would be 25.745. And then I'll write that down in my... And then we just end up using a... So we have a weight... We, have, we know what the crucible weighs. We have a weight of the soil before it goes into the furnace, a weight of the soil when it comes out of the furnace, and then we can calculate out what the actual percent of organic matter is. And, and again, this is an extra test. Well, it's, it's just $7. And some people like to know how much organic matter is in their soil. They might, ideally, you'd want to keep it somewhere between 4 and 8% for most crops. This is number 23. Put 23 on there. I'm going to put a little dot so I don't get lost. And so this would be 
seven seven. All right, thirty points. Yeah, thirty point seven seven three. And then we actually have a. Uh, we can calculate this out using a handheld calculator, or we have a. a we actually have a little program in our computer where we just put these weights in and it just automatically does it. We also measured the soil pH. And the pH is a very important um, variable. It's actually the master variable. The soil pH affects the availability of all plant nutrients. So what we end up doing is we mix um, a scoop of soil with a scoop of, uh, um, with five mils of water we let it equilibrate for about half an hour and then we run it on our pH meter and um, so we get we get the initial pH once we get that after all the pHs are done this tells us what the soil pH is at now but it doesn't necessarily give us an indication of how much limestone to add so after all the pHs are run we add a chemical buffer we're using the modified malic buffer and we add that to the soil and water slurry that we've already created and then we reread the buffer pHs and if you know what the buffer pH is um, when you think about it what is the buffering uh, capacity of the soil it's the soil's ability to resist change and what affects that how much organic matter and how much clay is in the soil so we, we use a modified um, malic buffer and we know that it's at a pH of 6.6 .6, and we see how far down it takes that 6.6. .6. If it takes it down a lot, it's a well-buffered soil. If it doesn't hardly take it down at all, it's a poorly buffered soil. So if you have a poorly buffered soil and you're trying to change the pH, you would not need to add as much limestone to it as if you had a well-buffered soil. Some people want to know how much sand, silt, and clay is in the soil. And if they do that, it's an extra test. It's a mechanical analysis or soil textural analysis. And what we end up doing is we take some soil, we put it in a uh, blender cup with some sodium oxalate and some water, and we put it on our milkshake machine, and we let it um, mix for about 10 minutes. And then we pour it into these Boyuca cylinders, and we fill it to a particular volume. And then we need to take readings. And, and these, this basically works like Stokes' Law. So heavy particles settle faster. So what we would do is we, we use this little stirring rod to stir it all up. And we would stir it up very good. And then we will take our, our little stirring rod out. And we'll put in a hydrometer. And then we take a reading at 40 seconds. And then we'll after we take the reading, we'll take a temperature, and then what we'll do is we will take another reading at two hours, and through the process of subtraction, we're able to tell you how much sand, salt, and clay is in the soil. So we'll take our little reading. Our reading now is about 14, um, and in units that would be grams per liter. So then the, the cylinder can come out. So we set the timer for two hours. And then we did need a temperature because it's all temperature based. So we put our little, our little um, thermometer in there. It's real. And then it just takes 10, 15 seconds. We see that it's about 20 degrees. And then we can calculate out how much sand, silt, and clay is in the sample. So that, that is an extra test, an extra charge for an extra test. And we need a little bit more soil. So instead of sending in one cup, you would send in two cups. Then we would set our timer for two hours and we'll come back and we'll read it another um, reading in two hours. But you can see how this is graduated. So at the bottom are the heavier particles. This was sitting for a little bit. This hasn't been stirred and you can see that the particles are starting to settle. So that's how this um, works with the Boyuca cylinders and with the hydrometer. Heavier particles settle faster. And, and as they settle, they change the amount of particulate matter that's in solution and that's the reading that we're actually taking with the hydrometer because the hydrometer measures in grams of soil per liter so you can see these little measurements are grams of soil per liter it's kind of cool so once we know what your pH is and we know what the different nutrient values are and we know who you are 
were able to put this all into the computer and produce a soil test result, which we send to the client. We like to send it via email, so we ask that people please share with us their email address. What you'll notice is we do, we do test the four major uh, macro elements, and then these numbers don't necessarily mean very much to a person. Um, we think of them more as like an index, but what you want to do is you want to note where, where, which column your results fall in. Your goal is actually to get everything in the optimum. So we know what values would be below optimum, what would be optimum, what would be above optimum, and in the case of phosphorus, what would be excessive. So since the numbers aren't always clear to what people mean, we have these little bar graphs and they put them into the various columns. And then we'll tell you what the pH is. Don't worry about what the um, buffer pH is. Um, we use that to make limestone recommendations. We also can do an estimated cation exchange capacity. If it's somewhere around 10, that means you have a soil that has a fair amount of either clay and organic matter in it, and it can hold on to nutrient cations. So uh, a cation, let me go back, an ion is a charged particle. A cation is a positively charged particle. Um, your soil has the same, the same um, materials that cause it to have a good buffering capacity, the clay and organic matter are also responsible for holding on to the, the cations or the nutrients. And so we give people a rough estimate. Some people ask for organic matter, it's an extra test. Again, if you're somewhere between 4 and 8 percent, it's great for most crops. We have a few organic growers that really like to um, modify how much calcium, magnesium, and potassium that they have according to the base saturation. So while this doesn't mean that much to many people. Some people feel that it's important. And then we're able to analyze a bunch of trace elements. And there isn't any recommendations for trace elements. The only thing we have in Connecticut is because the soils are low in boron, you could, we can make recommendations for alfalfa or for commercial apple trees. Otherwise, what we've done is we took a thousand soils and we came up with a typical range. And we're telling you to just use it as a diagnostic tool. If it's really excessive, that means something's probably not quite right with the soil. Somehow it was contaminated with that particular trace element. Um, and if the pH is where it's supposed to be and the organic matter is where it's supposed to be, you should have good enough amounts of trace elements in your soil. And then we, we need you to tell us what you're growing. We have over 100 crops to choose from. We'll make limestone and fertilizer recommendations according to the crop. And we'll tell, you, we'll tell you what the target pH is for the particular crop you're growing. And if you need to add limestone, how much. And then if you're a commercial grower, we would give you pounds of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium to add. If you were a homeowner, we have a tendency to make recommendations for a, a fertilizer you could purchase, like a 51010 or a 2443 or something along those lines. But for most of the, the agronomic crops and the commercial fruit and commercial vegetable crops, we just give you pounds of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium per acre. And then we give you some references. So every, every um, sample that we send out, you'll get a link to our general interpretation sheet. And that basically tells you what we test for and why. And then we give you specific references. So if you were growing lawns, we give you a lawn one. If you were a vegetable grower, we give you a vegetable one. For hemp growers, there isn't anybody in Connecticut that's doing research on fertility levels right now in Connecticut. So, but there are in several other New England states. So we've given you links to their hemp information on their website.